Okay, thank you, everyone. So um, the project I'm going to discuss today is part of um, PEER, is part of a larger uh, project um, that um, many people in my research group and collaborators have been working on. Uh, for this specific one, um, I've been working with um, Dr. Zhangshan Kim, Bofei Zhu from UC Berkeley, uh, in my research group, Professor Misko Kubrinovsky from New Zealand, and um, Nathaniel Wagner from Slate um, Geotechnical Consultants. So we're discussing gravels because we've been observing liquefaction in gravelly deposits for quite some time now. Uh, and it has again been highlighted in more recent events like the 2014 Cephalonia earthquake in Greece, as well as in 2016 in the Kaikoura New Zealand earthquake. In those two last um, cases, uh, the effects impacted critical infrastructure for both of these locations as the ports in these locations experienced significant lateral displacements and of course, gravelly material ejecta was also observed. So it's really important to better understand the behavior of these materials under dynamic conditions. Now, contrary to sands, they haven't received the attention that we have uh, traditionally given to sandy materials. So I'm just showing an example here, of course, of the wide range of available triggering tools um, that we have Typically, the way we look at it is that we compare demand and, and supply in a way. So we look at penetration resistance or some sort of test indicating the possible resistance of the material against liquefaction. And then we compare it to the seismic demand to determine whether um, at that site we have to worry about liquefaction triggering. And so we can use field tests like the standard penetration test or the cone penetration test, or even non-invasive techniques like um, geophysical-based techniques measuring shear wave velocity. But such uh, triggering charts have not been established for gravelly materials. In addition to that, there is the extra challenge of dealing with a material that has large particle sizes. And so that renders field testing, and as we're going to see later on, laboratory testing equally challenging. We do have options, but they all have um, opportunities as well as challenges that come with them. Uh, and this is why we uh, have um, basically chosen to look at and, and apply an integrated approach as we're going to see later on. So as I mentioned, um, the same challenge holds for laboratory conditions. Um, large particle size means that our laboratory devices have to be larger so we don't have boundary effects. Uh, that means that it's significantly more challenging and, and difficult to prepare um, specimens that we will test. And in the literature until recently, um, the main information or, or data available was um, triaxial cyclic testing and triaxial testing uh, needs the presence of a membrane that can create membrane compliance issues. So within my research group, um, as I said, this is part of the bigger um, research projects that we've been working on in the past several years. We are trying to follow an integrated approach. So basically take the best of all um, that we can get from the various uh, approaches. So what I mean by that is that we conduct laboratory testing and I will talk about that more specifically. We also do a lot of field testing at a variety of sites. We look at what has happened following uh, earthquake events from well-documented case histories and try to learn as much as we can from them. And we have also um, done some 3D discrete element modeling analysis, trying to understand better the particle to particle um, interactions uh, for the gravel material scale. Now for this specific project within PEER, we have focused on laboratory testing and a specific case um, history that I'm gonna um, show in more detail, uh, but I just wanted to frame it around the overall work we've been doing uh, for the last several years. The case study that we have selected comes from the center port, uh, a port in Wellington, New Zealand, that experienced, as I mentioned earlier, significant lateral displacements in some locations up to a meter, if not more, of lateral displacement. There were gravelly material ejecta observed following the 2016 Kaikoura earthquake. Um, this port, I'm not sure if you can see my, my cursor, I hope you can, but in this area that I'm uh, highlighting um, is basically where the center port um, currently um, is. Uh, it was uh, done on uh, as part of reclamation of this uh, land about 40 to 50 years ago. And so the materials there uh, basically are gravelly, sandy um, deposits. 
Now, what makes this um, very exciting as a case study uh, is the presence of several um, strong motion stations that allow us to have a very good understanding of the shaking that that um, um, location experienced. And this is a very important point of a well-documented case study to really very well understand uh, what the, um, the dynamic uh, loading was. And then um, it's, a, it's a busy picture, but I think that makes my point for me that um, this area has been very, very well characterized in terms of the geotechnical parameters of the materials that line the subsurface. Uh, there is a lot of testing that was done before the earthquake, but of course, a lot of testing that followed the seismic event, uh, different types of tests, uh, both penetration type testing, also non-invasive geophysical based methods, but that gives us a higher confidence on understanding the subsurface materials. And this was all presented and documented um, very nicely in the gear report that Kubinowski led in 2017 and some follow-up papers. Um, uh, so in addition to that, I just provide a little bit more information in terms of the grain size distribution of these materials to give you a better understanding of where we are. And the two figures to the right basically show the grain size distribution in the gray area of the entire uh, material that was under the center port. And it compares it with the local marine deposit in the light blue uh, area to uh, show the difference in the grain size distribution. So we were able to have material sent to us in our lab so that we can test it from New Zealand. And um, the borehole, um, we had uh, materials from several boreholes, but the borehole that we're going to be using um, to, we have been using for our testing comes to us from borehole TP2. And we see the location of that borehole um, in terms of the center port and uh, what the entire cross section north south looks like, as well as the grain size distribution uh, from our own testing. So in order to do the testing, as I mentioned before, we have a limitation in terms of the grain size. Uh, we need to use a larger device. And so uh, we built one uh, essentially many, many years ago when I was still at the University of Michigan with the help of Geocomp, we have a prototype uh, large size cyclic simple shear uh, machine device. Um, it has 12 inch diameter uh, specimen accommodation, five inches um, height, and it uses a set of stacked rings that are Teflon coated to reduce it has many, many uh, capabilities. I don't have the time to go over them all. I'll just highlight a couple. We're able to go uh, up to five atmospheres in terms of the vertical load, which I think is important in understanding the overburden um, effect, the overburden stress effect. Um, and um, my own personal favorite is that it is outfitted both with a bender element and also accelerometer system to allow us to measure the shear wave velocity of every specimen that we test. So I'm just going to show some representative results from these materials that we've been testing. These are some uh, monotonic test results at three different relative densities that we've been targeting. And you also see uh, the complementary here, shear wave velocity value for comparison. Uh, and you see by, uh, by color that the behavior, of course, is um, the expected behavior given the critical um, state um, uh, framework that we all know uh, for granular materials. Um, and so, of course, um, this makes us feel good when we see this in terms of what is expected for the behavior. We, of course, then conduct cyclic test results. We do that for a variety of parameters. Um, I don't have the time to show all the parametric analysis, but of course, we change the cyclic stress ratio, we change the vertical load, we change, uh, as you saw, the relative density. This is for the looser uh, relative density, um, and these are the cyclic test results. Uh, and as you can see, in the loose conditions, um, we have liquefaction uh, in very small number of cycles. Um, this is a nice way of representing the results because, because it gives you an overall uh, picture of the dynamic response of this material. And just for um, comparison, this is the densest of uh, the specimens that we've done. And you clearly see the effect of the relative density in how the number of cycles to liquefaction increases and the behavior as we move towards liquefaction, which by the way, we define as single amplitude 3.75% uh, changes as well. Now, as we carry with us all of these uh, results, the test results, um, a nice way to put them together is by showing a plot like this one, where basically you show the effect of the cyclic stress ratio together with relative density uh, on the number of cycles to liquefaction. 
we see we see a very expected response. However, the curves lie at a different spot than um, what we would get for different types of materials like sanding materials. And so it's important to have these when we're trying to model, for example, these materials, because we can use these curves as direct input for certain considerative models so that we can better um, calibrate uh, the models we use to predict liquefaction. We also look at what happens after, right? So we're not just interested in whether it triggers or not, but what happens after. And we do that following two different types of tests uh, post-cyclic. We either monotonically shear immediately after liquefaction, which gives us an understanding of the post-liquefaction shear strength, uh, or residual strength, or however we want to uh, call it. And again, we see the impact of force of relative density here, where we start at a very low um, shear stress at the very beginning after liquefaction. But then, of course, the strength builds up um, smaller for the looser, higher for the dense. We can also reconsolidate to the original uh, vertical load that we had at the beginning of the test and look at uh, volumetric strain, post-cyclic volumetric strain. This is also of great interest. And we're also seeing that the gravelly materials do not necessarily follow what we would predict using sand-based uh, developed methods. The good news in terms of volumetric strain is that so far we're seeing that the gravelly materials always come um, below uh, the volumetric strain potential that would have been predicted using um, sand models, uh, but we are developing um, ones for gravels as well. And also we have been more recently looking at the effects of initial shear stress because the K-alpha relationship is a very important one. And we wanna have a material specific relationship because we're already again seeing that the sand based K-alpha curves may not be appropriate to be used for gravel materials as well. Um, the grain size distribution is a very important topic. I know we have a follow-up um, presentation by Jason, and he's probably going to go into a much um, a deeper depth than this, but I did want to highlight that we have been testing different types of materials as part of our uh, larger project. And this is important because hopefully by the end of the project, it will give us a better understanding of how important exactly this grain size distribution difference is. And so just for reference, I've just uh, selected three of the materials we've been testing, uh, your typical um, sand, uniform sand. Uh, we've been doing uniform gravels. And then you see how the New Zealand material compares, much well-graded material, of course. And we are seeing the differences that that distribution of grain sizes makes. And then we see, of course, the range of other materials we've tested in the field. Now, as I mentioned, we've been doing a lot of field testing as well. This is not part of this specific project, but we have been focusing on a couple of different case histories specifically, just because of how well documented they are. And that includes um, the Cephalonia ports in Greece following the 2014 earthquakes and the center port in Wellington following the 2016 uh, earthquakes. Now, for um, the kind of ongoing part of the work for this project, we like to do a full numerical modeling of the center port of Wellington with our improved uh, models following the laboratory work that we've been doing in characterizing these materials to have more specific curves for this material, and then combining basically all these aspects of a well-documented case history, which includes observations, field observations of uh, displacements, that you can measure and have been documented. Uh, a very uh, good um, a documentation of the ground motion, because that's going to be your demand. And it's really important that you know exactly what that is. Um, of course, we have cross sections from past geotechnical reports at the ports, including the follow up investigations that we do, and then supplementary field testing that we go out and do um, to just increase the database and improve even more the characterization of the materials. Now, the slides I'm going to show are for the work, the similar work that we're planning to do for center port but that we have already done for the port of cephalonia so that you get an idea a little bit of what's to come for this ongoing part of the work so but, it's really, but it's really exciting because as i said um, it's really exciting as a geotechnical engineer to be able to have all the parts of the puzzle, if I dare say so myself. There's always something a little bit missing and something more that you would like to have, but it's not very often that you can find all these parts that will help you have higher confidence in your analysis. So for example, in this case that was just recently published, uh, we have the port of Cephalonia that has been very well documented in terms of the displacements. We have a very good understanding of the cross section and the subsurface conditions, and of course conducted, as I mentioned, our own follow-up tests. 
And then we conduct um, 2D flak analysis, dynamic flak analysis, and we use a variety of models for pore pressure generation to try and understand liquefaction. So this is just a snapshot of pore pressure um, of the RU pore pressure ratio uh, for a specific cross section. Um, and then we can also um, see the displacements of the wall and compare, most importantly, with the observed displacements and see when the um, when there is good agreement, which models um, you know do better at what conditions. I don't think, and I'm not a believer of, you know, one model is necessarily better than someone else, but I do think it's important to understand the strengths of every model and use them appropriately. Um, so with that, I'll just um, give some quick thoughts that we've been um, kind of, uh, I guess, making um, as, you know, from the total work that we've done so far. Uh, but we have definitely seen that that threshold that used to exist of 200 meters per second as a as a good threshold for which um, you don't have to worry above which you don't have to worry for gravels is not really holding true, not in the lab or the field. And we have been, we're, we're gonna be publishing uh, some papers that have just been accepted for new triggering curves that are gonna be now um, just based on gravel response. Uh, the other thing we need to be careful when we're looking at case studies, trying to determine whether liquefaction occurred or not, is that sometimes layering prohibits necessarily that evidence to come up at the top, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there wasn't liquefaction. And of course, we're seeing very exciting aspects of a lot of the response at the micro scale through the discrete element modeling analysis that we've been doing that hopefully we'll be able to share in the future. So with that, I'm just gonna thank again um, because uh, none of this is possible without a great group of people and a great uh, group of agencies and groups that fund the work. So um, just to thank again, uh, Misko and Kyle and Dimitris as part of the broader um, project and Jung Sun who's been doing a lot of the testing recently uh, and everybody who's been funding us um, so far. And thank you for your attention.